Good morning. My name is Gregory Longini. I'm the board secretary for Chicago Transit Authority. On October 14th of 2020, the Office of the Secretary issued a notice of changed format of the meeting of the meeting of the Committee on Finance, Audit, and Budget and of the Transit Board scheduled for October 14th, 2020, due to COVID-19. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker issued a disaster proclamation on September 18th, 2020, to address this emergency. Section 12 of the proclamation declares that in-person attendance of more than 50 people is not feasible in light of public health concerns. This means that Chicago Transit Authority public meetings occurring on October 21st, 2020 will take place only virtually. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker's Executive Order 2020-07. My name is Gregory Longini. I'm the Executive Order Board Secretary of Chicago Transit, as well as Illinois Attorney General guidance to public bodies on the Open Meetings Act and the Freedom of Information Act during the COVID-19 pandemic, allow for public bodies to hold public meetings electronically to prevent the transmission of COVID-19. Let the record show that myself, Gregory Longini, and General Counsel Karen Simons are both physically present in the headquarters building here at 567 West Lake Street, Chicago, Illinois. Thank you. We are now ready to begin the finance audit and budget meeting of October 21st. Chairman Silva. Good morning. I would like to call to order the October 21st, 2020 meeting of the Committee on Finance, Audit, and Budget. Will the secretary call the roll? Yes, Judge Chevrolet. Present. Reverend Miller. Reverend Miller, please unmute. Reverend Miller. Let me continue. I'll come back to Reverend Miller. Uh, Reverend Jakes. Present. Um, Director Irvine. I'm present. Um, Director Alvaro Zales. Here. Chairman Silva. Present. Um, Director Miller, are you still here? Yes, Greg. Okay, so you're here, Reverend. So you're at the you're all set as well. So we have a quorum of the committee with uh, six. Uh, present, sir. Chairman Silver, we may proceed to agenda item number two. Our first order of business is the approval of the committee minutes of September 16, 2020. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. By Judge Chevrolet, seconded by Reverend Miller. And I'll take a roll call vote on the minutes. Judge Chevrolet. Yes. Reverend Miller. Yes. Reverend Jakes. Yes. Director Irvine. Yes. Director Alvaro Zales. Yes. Chairman Silva. Yes. Motion to approve the minutes passes with six yes votes. We may proceed to agenda item number three. Our next order of business is the finance report. Jeremy Fine. Good morning, Jeremy. Morning, I'm Jeremy Fine, your Chief Financial Officer, and I'll be walking through the results uh, for the month of August in year-to-date numbers. Uh, starting on the next page, uh, we see the August results. Uh, we see fare box totals uh, down to budget by about $22 million. Uh, fare, uh, passes uh, down a little over $13 million. Uh, so that uh, ends up the month uh, for fare and pass totals about $35 million down. Um, you know, as we've been talking about uh, since the pandemic began and the historic levels of funding uh, from federal stimulus came through, uh, you know, the story here of plugging these gaps is the CARES funding, which we'll talk more about in a moment. Reduced fare subsidy uh, is at budget, uh, non fare box totals uh, down about two and a half million dollars. So overall we see uh, the month of August uh, down about $37, $38 million. Uh, that is slightly better than what we saw last month. But again, the story here is CARES funding. Uh, and again, we'll talk about that more in a moment. On the next page, you see the year-to-date numbers. Uh, you know, again, similar uh, trajectory in the, in the various vectors here, uh, where we see the total revenue 
uh, down about 300 and, uh, or $233 million on a year-to-date basis. Again, uh, the CARES funding uh, is the critical component here as we move through uh, the rest of 2020. We've done a good job with regard to our expenses uh, and we continue to do so uh, with the assistance of the, of the departments here at CTA. Uh, we continue to see uh, labor uh, and materials uh, you know, down a little bit, but essentially flat uh, to budget uh, for the month. Uh, we see continued uh, you know, favorability on our fuel and power lines. Uh, you know, we see the benefit of locking in at those historically low rates continue to manifest themselves. Uh, we see IMD and security services essentially flat for the month. And then we see other expenses uh, favorable by about $2 million. So overall, uh, we end the month of August at about $3.2 million uh, for the month. Uh, so again, great opportunity to try to expand the and extend the CARES funding that we get uh, by seeing uh, these expenses coming in uh, at or slightly below uh, budget. So again, this is for the month of August. On the next page, we see the year-to-date numbers. Again, similar trajectory in the various lines uh, where we see the, the real benefit here of fuel and power uh, coming in about four and a half million to $5 million positive for each of those lines and other expenses coming in uh, positive. So we end up on a year-to-date basis, about $14.5 million to the positive. Uh, so again, this is helping us extend those CARES dollars as far as we can. Uh, so again, a great assistance with the departments here on uh, trying to trim expenses as best we can. Uh, so we're doing a good job uh, on that front. With regard to the public funding, uh, you know we've started uh, walking through this on a monthly basis here recently. Uh, and what we're showing here this month is sales taxes uh, slightly unfavorable uh, for the month, as is PTF. Uh, both of those are down in the five to six million dollar range. However, we have started to see some turnaround uh, here on the real estate transfer tax uh, for the month of uh, you know August, which is the last collection that we received for a real estate transfer tax. It came in at budget. Uh, so again, a little bit of silver lining here on that particular line. So overall, uh, we see monthly collections, almost $63 million, but down about $12 million to budget on a uh, monthly basis. On the next page, we, we see the same figures on a year-to-date basis. Uh, and again, over $400 million of collections, uh, but down about $83 million, $84 million on a year-to-date basis. Again, the story here is the CARES funding. Uh, the CARES funding is helping us offset the shortfalls that we're seeing on system generated revenues, as well as on public funding. So again, a critical component for us here in 2020. Uh, and again, very, very helpful to close those gaps. On the next pages, we talk about the CARES Act draws that we've done to date. Uh, for the month here, uh, we're expecting to do a draw of around uh, $50 million. Uh, that will put us on a on an year-to-date basis, having drawn about $280 million of the $817 million that we've received in total. So again, uh, we've only drawn about a third of the overall um, you know, amount that we were allotted. Again, our controls on expenses and whatnot are allowing us to, to be able to extend the benefit of the receiving those dollars as long as we can. Then the last section uh, here is with regard to the commodities that we purchase, fuel, power, and natural gas. Again, as I highlighted in the, uh, in, the, in, in the earlier slides, we continue to benefit from locking in at historically low prices uh, for fuel and power, uh, and we'll continue to look for selective purchases in those commodities as well as natural gas as we continue to move forward. Uh, but that's been a critical component for us to be able to uh, see the positive variance uh, on our expenses. So again, very good uh, performance there on those two commodities in particular. With that, that concludes uh, that portion of the presentation and glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes, Alejandro. 
So we are relying totally, okay, in CARES funding to operate. That's bottom line. So we, we obviously are still receiving uh, public funding dollars, uh, you know, Fairbox related revenues as well. But yes, the CARES component uh, is a critical component for us to continue uh, to, you know, operate here uh, in 2020 as we have been. Uh, so again, I think that that was a nod from the federal government on how critical uh, transit is, uh, you know, not just here in Chicago, but nationwide. Uh, and again, I think that the fact that we received that historic level uh, of funding from the federal government, um, you know, with support from both sides of the aisle was kind of a nod to the fact of how critical public funding is. And we have left uh, CARES money for how many months more? So uh, based on current projections, uh, we're expecting the, the current uh, allocation of CARES funding to last us through. Uh, 2020 and into uh, the early part of 2021. So again, this will, the $817 million will carry us through 2020 and into 21. Okay, thank you. Director Alvaro Zalas, do you have any questions? No, I just want to compliment our team for um, the hard work, especially with regards to the control on expenses. Um, you know, obviously, that has made a huge impact and has really lengthened um, what the effect that the CARE Act is having because we're, we're able to extend that. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, I know when I asked uh, previously in the briefings with regards to one of our biggest savings, and I know you also mentioned the area of, of, of the power um, and the fuel, natural gas uh, that we purchase and um, so thank you, because that makes such a big impact, I think, long-term impact. And I, I'm power, I saw we're locked into 2024 even, right? And on the other two to 2021. Um, I know you mentioned the real estate transfer tax um, also is doing well. Do, uh, the McDonald's sale, is that um, noted as of yet or will that uh, come later? Do we know what that impact has as of yet for us? Yeah, so the uh, the impact, uh, we're still confirming on what month that will fall into in regard to uh, the revenues that we receive, uh, but we estimate based on the size of the transaction that's been reported in the press that that would generate about $1.2 million just from that sale alone to the CTA. Uh, so again, uh, those types of commercial sales are meaningful uh, as a revenue opportunity for us. Uh, and again, we'll, hopefully this means that with this big sale like that, um, that that opens the market for other large commercial sales as well, because uh, there's been a lot of uh, you know kind of pent up demand on the uh, on the commercial side. So hopefully that's a good indication that there's going to be future sales as well. Well, just and once again, thanks and, and congrats because that's really helpful. I know we still need additional uh, CARES Act money, but this really helps us at least extend um, the work that we're doing for as long as we can. So thanks to all the team. Thank you. I'll pass that on to the team. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Judge Shever, any questions? No questions. Uh, Director Miller? Uh, yes, thanks, Greg. Uh, Jeremy, I heard you talk about uh, $83 million um, is down uh, in revenue year to date. Um, and I know that, we, you know, in the midst of the pandemic, are we doing anything or is anything can be done as to um, enlist more ridership? At this time, are we doing anything to work towards that? So again, I think that we're we're trying to uh, handle the health uh, concerns and health crisis uh, here first. Uh, you know, I know that Mike Connolly may be able to provide some additional, uh, you know, input on you know where our ridership is vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, the social distancing guidelines. So I don't know if Mike Connolly is uh, is available, uh, but Jeremy, if not, Jeremy, let me. Let me weigh in before Mike does. Uh, uh, Director Miller, I think one of the things that you need to keep in mind is that we still have capacity restrictions placed on CTA service. So uh, we are not running full crush loads on any of our trains or buses. And so uh, as Mike can explain to you, our ridership is, is about 30% of normal for us. We're carrying around 500,000 people a day. Um, that's close. To the capacity limits that we have for what we're what we're carried cable and still 
maintain the social distancing and other guidelines that we have. So while we have certainly been actively engaged in, in marketing and campaigning the fact that we have taken a lot of steps to make sure that our customers can ride CJ safely, we haven't really marketed bringing people back um, because of the capacity limitations that we know we face um, uh, at this point in time. But even without that, as, as Mike can explain to you, We've seen a, a gradual growth in our ridership uh, that has gotten us up to that 30% plateau. Um, uh, and, you know, for that, you know, 500,000 trips a day for most transit systems around this country would be viewed as a very good day <laughs> in normal times. So while it's low, extremely low for us, uh, we're still carrying a fairly large number of people every day, um, uh, just based, even based on these capacity limits that we have in place. Mike, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to what I just said. That, that's, that's, that's answering. Thank you. I, I guess okay. I, I was talking about, you know, more 2021 into the new year. But, I, yeah. I, you know, when, when, you're right. When 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 we come out of uh, the impact of the pandemic and the city starts to reopen more, we do have plans for how we're going to market and encourage ridership to come back to CTA. Um, uh, obviously, those plans are still dependent on when the when the virus is actually brought under control. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Reverend Jakes. Any questions? No questions. Um, Director Irvine. No questions. Thank you. All right, that completes um, agenda item number three. But before we move on, I think it would be an appropriate time to change the sign language interpreters. So LJ can come on now. Okay, I think we're ready. So that's, um, there are no further questions, Chairman Silva, on the finance report, so we may proceed to agenda item number four. Our next order of business is the review of an ordinance authorizing a license agreement with Cash Depot LTD to install, operate, and maintain automated, automated tailor machines at designated rail stations and employee locations. Jeremy Fine. And Michelle Cura. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Jeremy Fine, your Chief Financial Officer. And today I present for your consideration a license agreement awarding Cash Depot the non exclusive right to install, operate, and maintain ATMs at 67 pre selected sites on CTA property. These ATMs are located at a combination of rail stations and employee locations and provided amenity to CTA customers and employees, as well as generate a revenue stream for CTA. An additional 87 ATM sites on CTA property are licensed to Cardtronics under a separate agreement. The license agreement would commence on October 30th, 2020, and the initial term of the agreement is for seven years with two one-year options to extend. Cash Depot will be responsible for all costs related to the procurement, installation, servicing, and operation of the ATMs, including but not limited to installation of all necessary improvements, such as electrical and telecommunications connections. Staff estimates that the Cash Depot bid will generate at least $620,000 of the initial seven-year term. I'm glad to answer any questions. Chairman Silva, any questions? Is uh, this was an RFP, okay, I mean, the we look okay in other in other suppliers okay beside uh, beside the uh, cash depot yes absolutely um you know we've done this uh, rfp several times um you know we uh, continue to see uh you know competitive bids come in uh we're very excited uh about cash depot uh, who put in a very competitive bid uh, for this block. As you may recall, this block of uh, ATMs uh, was previously serviced by PNC Bank. Uh, but again, I think that uh, we got a very nice bid from uh, Cash Depot. Uh, they operate very similarly to Cartronics. And again, I think that this is a good uh, partnership for uh, CTA, uh, for our customers, uh, and for uh, Cash Depot. Is that the first time that we're going to be working with Cash, uh, with cash Depot? Yes, it's the first time that we're working with Cash Depot uh, again, but they're a, they're a known entity out there in the marketplace, uh, service uh, thousands of machines across the U.S., across the country, across the world, 
Uh, so again, there's a, there's a few big players in this space uh, and uh, they are definitely one of those. Okay, thank you. Director Alvarez-Alvarez, any questions? Sorry about that, I didn't click that off. Um, so no, just I guess the only comment I was gonna, um, or question maybe is this, this is expected to bring in more revenue than the uh, uh, previous contract that we had, is that correct, Jeremy? It, it's a little bit below the prior contract, but uh, above the, uh, the most recent bid uh, on the Cartronics piece. So it's, uh, again, it was a, a very good bid that we received from uh, you know, Cash Depot. And I think it's a, a testament to uh, the strength of the system uh, and the footprint that we are able to provide uh, for the ATMs throughout the system. Okay, thank you. Judge Shever, any questions? No questions. Reverend Miller? No questions. Reverend Jakes? No questions. Director Irvine? No questions. Um, there are no further questions, Chairman Silver. Our next order of business is the Chairman, Chairman we, we need to uh, get this on the omnibus. Then item number four. Okay, since there are no further questions, may I have leave to place this item on the omnibus for board approval? So moved. Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Um, so then Chairman Silva, we may proceed to agenda item number five. Our next order of business is the review of an ordinance authorizing a license agreement with Compass Group USA by and through its canteen division to install, operate, and maintain personal protective equipment, vending machines at designated rail station. Jeremy Fine. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Jeremy Fine, your Chief Financial Officer. And today I present for your consideration a specialty vending license agreement with Canteen, a division of Compass Group. This license agreement grants Canteen the non-exclusive right to operate personal protective equipment, PPE vending machines on CTA property. The PPE vending machines vend products like hand sanitizer, disposable face masks, N95 face masks, hand sanitizing wipes, and disposable gloves. The contract was procured through the JLL process using the specialty vending RFP. Uh, this RFP was initially offered in May of 2017 and resulted in agreements for mobile phone battery charge rentals, photo booths, and fresh food vending machines. The CTA staff uh, proposes to initially deploy six PPE vending machines to test the viability of the machines on CTA property. The initial locations are Belmont, Roosevelt and 79th on the red, Midway on the orange line, Jeff Park on the blue line, and Kedzie on the green line. Uh, the initial term of the uh, proposed license agreement is for three years uh, with two one-year options to extend. And while we receive a small payment for uh, uh, on this contract, those funds will be reinvested in the system. And it's, a, it's important that this provides a new uh, service option to our customers uh, to allow them to access PPE uh, while riding the system. I'm glad to answer any questions. For how long is the contract? So it's a three-year contract with two one-year options. So are we expecting okay to be selling okay PPEs okay in three years? Uh, potentially, uh, you know there is some flexibility to change the makeup of what's in the machines. Uh, but, you know, again, I think that, um, you know, we'll have to see how this health crisis, uh, you know, kind of flows through people's uh, reaction to how they uh, how they react to flu season and the like. So I think that there's some real, uh, you know, opportunity here in the PPE sector as well, as we continue to move forward, even after we receive a vaccine. So if we receive the vaccine uh, and the sales go down, OK, we, we still going to keep them there? So again, we have the flexibility uh, to change some of the makeup um, within the machines of what's being offered. Uh, so again, I think that there's opportunities, uh, you know, for certain types of PPE, uh, you know, maybe not face masks or, or whatnot, but maybe, uh, you know, there's, there's other things with hand sanitizer and, and whatnot in particular times of the year. There's also opportunity to, uh, you know, for you know, kind of over the counter, uh, you know, aspirin and things like that. So again, I think there's some flexibility here to deal with 
kind of the, the opportunities and, and what our customers were looking for, uh, as well as providing a, a good customer service here. So, Thank you. Director Alvaro Rosales. Well, I, I know initially I had some concerns with the pricing of um, one of the items or two of the items that were a little high, and then I got feedback that it was a lot less than what we had initially been told. So I think just, um, you know, we want to make sure that the products are reasonably priced so that people are able to purchase them um, at, a, at a good price. So I think um, that's the only comment I would make on this, but I think it's a good idea that we're, we're providing this because this is needed. Yeah, and ab absolutely, and we agree. Um, you know, price points are a, a, a major concern of ours, and and Canteen uh, is a known entity to us. Uh, they provide these types of services to others around the country, so we'll be watching. Uh, you know, what the price points are, what this what's being offered in the machines, uh, and ensuring that we're very competitive uh, with the market at large. Thank you, Dr. Chevrolet. No questions. Um, Director Miller. No questions. Director Jakes. No questions. Director Irvine. Um, Jeremy, does, um, do you have information about how this is performing in other systems that have rolled out a similar? System? It's it's relatively new. Um, you know, MT, New York MTA has uh, recently rolled it out. Uh, there's also some locations at uh, Amtrak and Metra. Um, there's also some, uh, you know, throughout airports as well. Uh, but we'll, we're tracking that. We'll definitely circle back with the board and provide, um, you know, how these services are, how these services are performing, uh, you know, kind of nationwide as well as how they're performing here at CTA. Cause that's something that we're definitely uh, looking at and tracking. But it, again, this is kind of a new rollout uh, and we're excited that it's, you know, we're on the kind of the front end, the cutting edge here with rolling this out um, across the system. Thanks, Jeremy. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Um, we are finished with questions, Chairman Soto. Since there are no further questions, may I have leave to place this item on the omnibus for board approval? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded, uh, Chairman Silva. So we may proceed to agenda item number six. Our next sort of business today is the review of an ordinance authorizing a sub lease to 7 Eleven Inc. of ground floor space located at 567 West Lake Street, Chicago, Illinois. Bill Mooney. Morning, Bill Mooney, your Chief Infrastructure Officer. Real estate staff recommends the approval of an ordinance authorizing the lease of 2,131 square feet of retail space located on the ground floor of 567 West Lake to the current tenant, 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven will continue to operate a convenience store offering snacks and incidental grab-and-go items. The lease has an initial annual rent of $41.53 per square foot or $88,500 for the first year. And the term is five years with two five-year options. The agreement includes annual rent escalations of 3% and 7-Eleven will be responsible for a proportionate share of building operating expenses. The tenant will also be responsible for all utilities and taxes. I'll be happy to take any questions at this time. Chairman Silva? No questions. Director Alvaro Rosales? No questions. Um, Judge Chevrolet? No questions. Reverend Miller? No questions. Reverend Jakes? No questions. Director Irvine? No questions. Um, there are no further questions, Chairman Silva. See, if there are no further questions, may I have leave to place this item on the omnibus for board approval. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded, Chairman Silva. So we may now proceed to agenda item number seven. Our next order of business is an ordinance authorizing the license from the city of Chicago of parcels adjacent to the authority's West Choke facility along Maple Avenue. Bill Mooney. Thank you. Staff recommends the approval of an ordinance authorizing a license of certain city-owned real estate near CTA's West Shops facility. The city of Chicago owns various unimproved land adjacent to the authority's West Shops facility consisting of approximately 78,062 square feet. The properties are located along Maple Avenue and are between the West Shops facility complex and Pulaski Avenue. The license has a term of 10 years, which will run through December 31st, 2030, 
and will automatically renew annually unless terminated by either party. The city has agreed to license the properties to the CTA for $1. I'll be happy to take any questions at this time. So we will pay them $1? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Good job. Director Gonzalez? No questions. Uh, Judge Chevrolet? No questions. Reverend Miller? No questions. Reverend Jakes? No questions. Um, Director Irvine? No questions. And there are no further questions on this item, Chairman Silva. Since there are no further questions, may I have leave to place this item on the omnibus for board approval? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded, Chairman Silva, so you may now proceed to agenda item number eight. Our next order of business is an ordinance authorizing the purchase of cyber insurance coverage for policy year November 1st, 2020 to October 31st, 2021. Steve Wood. Uh, good morning, directors. Uh, Steve Wood uh, with CTA's Law Department. We are coming before the board on this first renewal of our cyber insurance policy. This is an annual policy, and the term is from November 1, 2020 to October 31, 2021. Our insurance broker, uh, Mesereau, and our DBE Paradigm marketed this new coverage to the insurance markets, and we recommend proceeding with the incumbent insurer named Beasley, uh, which offers the best coverage at the lowest premium. The policy continues to provide a coverage limit of $5 million, but our deductible is increasing from $100,000 to $250,000, and the proposed insurance premium, including taxes, is approximately $88,039, which is an increase of about 17.5% from last year's premium. The increase is the result of a hardening in the insurance markets generally in light of COVID, and uh, therefore the reduction in capacity and competition in this marketplace. Nonetheless, the insurance policy provides the same protections for the CTA related to cyber attacks or intrusions of the CTA's computers and network as the initial policy did. I'm happy to answer any questions. So are you comfortable, okay, with the prices going up? Uh, is the market, okay, strong, okay, for insurance companies? It, unfortunately, it is strong for insurance companies. Uh, the other uh, competitive um, offerings in this space were much higher in, in terms of premium. So uh, the incumbent came back with the, uh, the best price on this policy. Is that, is that the only type of insurance that is going up or is pretty much everybody? It's, I mean, it's pretty much everyone. Uh, COVID has really... Um, uh, caused many insurers in the market to pull back on the amount of risk that they're willing to expose themselves to. And when there's less competition in the market, uh, there's uh, higher prices for uh, the purchasers. Okay, thank you. Dr. Alvaro Rosales. I guess my only question is, it went way up, 17.5%. Do we ever think it'll go back down? I mean, does it ever go back down? <laughs> uh, it, it is hard to predict. On the railroad uh, insurance uh, policy that uh, we'll be talking about next, we have seen some fluctuation both up and down over the last five years. So uh, we can always uh, um, hope for the best. Okay, thanks. Director Chevrolet? No questions. Um, Director Miller? No questions. Director, Director Jakes? No questions. Uh, Director Irvine? No questions, thanks. Um, there are no further questions on this item, sir. Since there are no further questions, may I have leave to place this item on the omnibus for board approval? So moved. Second. That motion has been moved and seconded, but before we proceed, I would like to ask the sign language interpreters to uh, switch over back to Ellen, please. I believe that Ellen is now back on. So Chairman Silva, we may now proceed to agenda item number nine. Our next order of business is an ordinance authorizing the purchase of protective liability insurance for policy year November 1st, 2020 through October 31st, 2021. Steve. 
Uh, thank you, Director. Um, we are coming before the board for approval of our blanket railroad protective insurance policy. Again, this is an annual policy that the CTA has had in place now for 11 years. And this ordinance is for the renewal term of November 1, 2020 to October 31, 2021. This is a blanket policy that covers all CTA contractors and certain non-contractors who perform work within 50 feet of any CTA railroad right of way. The CTA enrolls these businesses in the program and then prorates the cost of the insurance across capital construction projects so that the CTA is not out of pocket for the cost of this insurance. Because the CTA is in the marketplace uh, purchasing this policy, we're able to use our bargaining power in the marketplace to secure a much lower rate than individual contractors, individual DBEs or non-contractors could secure. Our insurance broker, Mesero and DBE Paradigm, again, marketed the renewal of this policy to the insurance market and the incumbent insurer, Aspen Specialty Insurance, offered the best price for this renewal. The premium has increased 11% compared to last year, which represents an increase from 19 cents per $100 of construction cost to 21 cents per $100 of construction cost. Uh, the rates have really been bouncing around in a pretty narrow band over the last few years. Uh, we had a high of 25 cents a few years ago to a low of 18 cents about five years ago. Um, so uh, compared to the standard market rate of between 45 cents and 55 cents per $100 of construction cost, we still believe that this is uh, a, a quite a bargain for the CTA and, and quite beneficial to our contractors and DBEs. We believe the, uh, that Aspen will provide excellent uh, service and responsiveness on this policy, and we recommend renewal with this carrier. I'm happy to answer any questions. So in this case, okay, the, the prices didn't go as high as in the cyber. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the end of that. That, that in this one, okay, the prices didn't go as high as cyber. That's right. Yes. And it's the same broker, right? Uh, it's the same broker, but it's a different market and it's a different type of insurance uh, uh, product that's out there with a different competitor. So it's not the same insurance companies that are bidding on this work. Okay. So you're comfortable with it? Yes, very comfortable that they've uh, achieved for us the best option in the market. Thank you. Dr. Al Rosales? No questions. Judge Chevrolet? No questions. Reverend Miller. Uh, Reverend Miller, any questions? Or maybe step aside, we can always come back. He may have dropped off, dropped off, I don't see him. Okay. Is Reverend Miller still on, Herb? It looks like he just dropped off. Okay, then why don't we just wait a second then. Joining right now. Reverend Miller is on. Yes, he, it's connecting right now. Okay. Um, Reverend Miller, are you there? Reverend Miller? Let us know, Herb, when, he's, when it's clear. I see Director Miller connecting. Hello. Well, Director Miller, hi. Um, we were we were just reviewing um, Steve's presentation on the uh, liability, railroad liability insurance. Do you have any questions on that matter? No, I had no question, and I apologize. I'm, I'm no, need, it now. no need to, sir. It's it's um it's equipment. Um, Reverend Jakes. No questions, Greg. Director Irvine, any questions on that matter? No questions, Greg. All right, thanks, um, Chairman. So, but there's no further questions on uh, Steve's presentation. 
If there are no further questions, may I have leave to place this item on the omnibus for board approval? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded, uh, Chairman Silva. So um, we're finished with the ordinances, so now we can proceed to the contracts. We'll start with contract A1. Our next order of business is contract A1, a contract for the 2600 series rail car overhaul. Any questions, Chairman Silva, on this matter? So is this the Chinese company? No, this is not the Chinese company. This is an American company that um, often bids on our parts kits. They are American. Okay, thank you. Sure. Dr. Alvarez Alice? Um, no, I guess just with regards to the DBE participation, um, it's 9% of the contract. Did, did we do everything possible to um, get as much participation as possible on that? Uh, yes, Director. We, we looked at all the opportunities that, um, that this contract had. So we did assess a 9% goal, and the prime contractor actually committed to a 10.3% DB participation. So that will be the uh, commitment for the contract. But the, the goal we set... Um, make sense with regards to the market, I guess is more my question. Yes, yes. It's tough to find DBEs that that supply some of these parts um, because they are specialized and they are expensive, um, but we do have a few that um, that could supply them. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Judge Chevrolet? No questions. Um, Director Miller? No questions. Director Jakes? No questions, Greg. All right. Thank you, Director Irvine. No questions. All right, we're finished with questions on A1, Chairman Silver, so we may now proceed to contract number B as in boy one. Our next order of business is contract B1, a contract for the rental of lift equipment. I don't have any questions. All right, um, Director Alvaro Rosales. No questions. Judge Chevron. No questions. Reverend Miller? No question. Reverend Jakes? No questions. Director Irvine? No questions. Since there are no questions, Chairman Silva, on this matter, we may proceed to contract G as in girl one. Our next order of business is contract number G1, a change order for Oracle America. Chairman Silva, you have any questions on the Oracle contract? No, I don't have any questions. All right. Director Alvaro Rosales? No questions. Judge Chevrolet? No questions. Uh, Reverend Miller? No questions. Reverend Jakes? No questions. Director Irvine? No questions. All right, Chairman Silva, we may now proceed to contract I as an island, one. Our final order of business is contract number I-1, a contract for the CTA's RPM project. I don't have a question. Uh, do you say yes or no? No, I don't. We have no questions. All right, thank you. Um, Director Alvaro Rosales. No, I guess just a clarification. So the SBE program, um, it's part of uh, the, the U.S. Department of Transportation program that includes the DBE program. Could you just explain that a little bit? Clarify that for me. Yes, Get of course. Um, the, DBE, the DBE regulations require us to have a small business program. Um, so we have decided to use the same DBE regulations, size standards, and personal net worth standards for all small businesses. Um, the small business program is our race and gender neutral program. Great. Thanks for the explanation. Thank you. Judge Chevrolet. No questions. Director Miller. No questions. Uh, Director Jakes. No questions. Director Irvine. No questions. Uh, Chairman Silver, since there are no further questions on this matter, we may proceed to agenda to, to number 10A. Since there are no further questions, on the contracts, may I have leave to place all four contracts on the omnibus? No, no. Second. 
That motion was moved by Judge Chevrolet, seconded by Reverend Miller. So Chairman Silver, we may now proceed to number 10B. Since there is no further business to come before the committee, may I have a motion to approve the omnibus and recommend the, board, the omnibus for board approval? So moved. Second. Moved by Judge Chevrolet, uh, seconded by Director Miller. I will now take a roll call vote on that motion. Judge Chevrolet. Yes. Director Miller. Yes. Director Jakes. Yes. Director Irvine. Yes. Director Alvaro Rosales. Yes. Chairman Silva. Yes. That motion to approve the omnibus and recommend board approval passes with six yes votes. Chairman Silva, we now proceed to committee agenda item number 11. And finally, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Moved by Chevrolet, seconded by Miller. I'll take a roll call vote. Judge Chevrolet? Yes. Director Miller? Yes. Director Jakes? Yes. Director Irvine? Yes. Director Alvaro Rosales? Yes. Chairman Silva? Yes. That motion to adjourn is approved with six yes votes. We'll start the board meeting in about 10 more seconds. Everybody just stay on. And hold on one second, everybody. Um, notice meeting of the Chicago Transit Board of October 21st, 2020. Um, Chairman Alvaro Zalga, we're ready to begin when you are. Great. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call to order the regularly scheduled meeting of the Chicago Transit Board for October 21st, 2020. Uh, would the secretary call the roll, please? Yes. Judge Chevrolet? Present. Director Miller? Present. Director Jakes? Here. Director Irvine? Here. Director Alvaro Rosales? Here. Um, uh, Director Silva? Director Silva? Kind of went out of order here. Director Silva, you're uh, still muted, I think. Is everyone still muted? Yes. It's me. Okay, so we've got the quorum. I heard from all six committee, all six board members. And so also let's recognize that President Carter, General Counsel Karen Simons are also participating in this meeting. Our first order of business today, I'm sorry, back to you, Director Robin Gonzalez. Thank you, Greg. Um, our first order of business today is public comment. Greg, do we have any public comment? Yes, actually we do have one public comment. I apologize for getting confused. Um, we have Mr. Stevens. Um, I believe that he's been connected already. And so Mr. Stevens, we'd like to ask you to address the board, please. And please try to limit yourself to three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevens. Greg, this is Herb. Uh, Mr. Stevens emailed that he will not be able to participate at the last minute. Oh, okay. So it turns out, Chairman Alvaro Zales, that we do not have any public comment today. Got it. Thank you, Greg. Well, then we'll proceed with the meeting. Um, our next order of business today is the approval of the September 16, 2020 board minutes. The minutes were previously distributed. I will now entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the regular board meeting of September 16, 2020. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Judge Chevrolet. Yes. Uh, Director Miller. Yes. Director Jakes. Yes. Director Irvine? Yes. Director Silva? Yes. Uh, Chairman Alvaro Rosales? Yes. Uh, the motion to approve the minutes passes with six yes votes. Thank you. Our next order of business is executive session. It is my understanding, Karen, that there is executive session today. That's correct, Vice Chair. We will have executive session today pursuant to section two, paragraph C, 
subparagraphs five and six of the Open Meetings Act. I'll now, now entertain a motion to recess into executive session. And after moved and seconded by two board members, um, then Greg will call the roll again. So thank you. So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Um, Judge Chevron? Yes. Uh, Director Miller? Yes. Director Jakes? Yes. Director Irvine? Yes. Uh, Director Silva? Yes. Chairman Alvarez-Alves? Yes. The motion to recess into executive session passes with six yes votes. So we're going to go into executive session, and for the board members to know, we're going to take about a five or
So you've checked on, you're, you're all set, Herb, Every, everybody, and you're just going to, we'll just count us down then, right? Correct. Okay, when you count us down, I'll turn it over to Arabelle. Thank you. Oh. This is Greg Longini, and we're about to uh, return to the open meeting. And so I will now turn it back over to Chairman Alvaro Rosales. Welcome back, everyone. I will now entertain a motion to return to the open meet, open session. So moved. Second. Moved by uh, Judge Chevrolet, seconded by Reverend Miller. Um, I'll now take a roll call vote on returning to open session. Judge Chevrolet. Yes. Director Miller. Yes. Director Jakes. Yes. Director Irvine. Yes. Director Silva. Yes. Chairman Alvaro Rosales. Yes. Motion is approved, uh, Chairman. Great. Our next order of business is agenda item number 4-A. Karen? Thank you, Vice Chair. Item 4-A pertains to a 10-year lease that was approved by this board on August 12, 2015 with Sterling Racine LLC for the property owned by CTA at 120 North Racine in Chicago. The lease that was approved contains a provisional right of first refusal um, for Sterling Racine to purchase the property. Sterling Racine has indicated an interest in exercising this term, and the general counsel, myself, and the chief infrastructure officer, Bill Mooney, seek board approval to establish and negotiate terms related to the exercise of the right of first refusal, and if successful, we will return to the board for further authorization. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I will now entertain a motion to approve an ordinance authorizing uh, the exercise of the right of first refusal in the lease agreement with Sterling Racine LLC for property located at 120 North Racine Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. Um, we need a motion. We need the motion. I will, be, I will be abstaining on this, so someone else will have to move this. Good point. So moved. Second. A moved by Director Jakes and seconded by Director Miller. Now take a roll call vote. Judge Chevrolet. I abstain on this matter. Okay, thank you. Um, Director Miller. Yes. Director Jakes. Yes. Director Irvine. Yes. Um, Director Silva. Yes. Chairman Alvaro Rosales. Yes. Um, the motion is approved with five yes votes and one abstention by Director Chevrolet. Thank you. Our next order of business is agenda item number 4-B. Karen. Agenda, agenda item 4-B. Uh, will amend ordinance 006183, which an IGA between the city of Chicago and the CTA for the city's transfer of properties that it owns near Lake Street and Pulaski Road in the vicinity of the authority's West Shop facilities. Uh, the ordinance needs to be amended simply to extend the date by which CTA can, ex can exercise the acceptance of these properties from the city. So that's why this is before the board today. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I will now entertain a motion to approve an ordinance authorizing an amendment to ordinance number 006-183 to permit the transfer of properties near the authority's West Shops facility near Lake Street and Pulaski Road from the city of Chicago to the authority. So moved. Second. The motion was moved by Director Jakes and seconded by Director Miller. I will now take a roll call vote on 4B. Judge Chevrolet. I will abstain on this matter. Thank you. Director Miller. Yes. Director Jakes. Yes. Director Irvine. Yes. Director Silva. Yes. Chairman Alvaro Rosales. Yes. The motion to approve 4B passes with five yes votes. Uh, and one abstention by Director Chevrolet. 
Thank you, Greg. Our next order of business is a report from the committee on finance, audit, and budget. Director Silva. The committee on finance, audit, and budget met earlier this morning via Zoom video teleconference. The committee approved the September 16, 2020 minutes. The committee reviewed the finance report. The committee also reviewed the following six ordinances. One, an ordinance authorizing a license agreement with Cash People Limited to install, operate, and maintain automated teller machines at designated rail stations and employee locations. An ordinance authorizing a license agreement with Compass Group USA Inc. by and through the canteen division to install, operate, and maintain personal protective equipment, PPE, vending machines at designated rail stations. An ordinance authorizing a sublease to 7-Eleven Inc. of ground floor space located at 567 Wesley Street, Chicago, Illinois. An ordinance authorizing the license from the city of Chicago of parcels adjacent to the authority's West Shops facility along Maple Avenue. An ordinance authorizing the purchase of cyber insurance coverage for policy year November 1st, 2020 through October 31st, 2021. And an ordinance authorizing the purchase of blanket railroad protective liability insurance for policy year November 1, November 1st, 2020 through October 31st, 2021. The committee also reviewed four purchase and sales award recommendations. The committee approved all items and recommends board approval of all items. The committee placed all six ordinances and all four contracts on the omnibus. And that concludes my report, Chairman Alba Rosales. Thank you, Director Silva. Thank you very much. May I now have a motion to approve the omnibus as stated by Director Silva? Well, so moved uh, with an abstention on my part on items C and D. Second. Well, let's make sure I understand. So the, let me just make sure what C and B are here. I'm a little bit confused. C and, C and B were the, those executive session items, Judge Chevrolet? Yes. Those are not part of this omnibus. Oh, okay. Those, those were voted separately. Oh, so I see. Okay. In that case, I, I uh, still move on the on Chairman Silva's uh, request uh, to uh, approve the items that were on the omnibus. That were discussed all in FAB. Right. Just a few times. Okay. So it's been moved by Judge Chevrolet. Second. And seconded by Director Miller. So on the omnibus, it's been moved and second. I'll take a roll call vote. Judge Chevrolet. Yes. Reverend Miller. Yes. Reverend Jakes. Yes. Director Irvine. Yes. Director Silva. Yes. Chairman Alvaro Rosales. Yes. Motion to approve the omnibus, which is all the items that were in the finance committee is approved with six yes votes. Thank you. Our next order of business is a construction report. We'll hear from Bill Mooney. Morning. I'm Bill Mooney, your Chief Infrastructure Officer with your construction report. Our first project is our, we usually start as our Your New Blue uh, Signals project between Jefferson Park and O'Hare. You can advance the slides to slide five, please. So work continues in the underground infrastructure of duct banks and cabling to support the in-field equipment that is uh, in process of being installed. Um, we also continued cutting over the first of the relay houses, which I shared with you in the prior months is being set and beginning at Jefferson Park. And we did factory testing for the acceptance of the next two relay houses at Central and Foster. And we had a major infrastructure weekend, which is one of the last ones 
with a line cut between Harlem and Rosemont to put in major duck banks and other uh, subgrade infrastructure. We can move to the next slide, please. Here on the first picture, you can see excavations occurring near Cumberland Station. This is for the foundations of the future relay house that will be going there. Next slide, please. Um, this work is at River near River Road, which is just south of Rosemont Station. Um, they're installing what we call insulated joints, which allow us to isolate out signals in the rails themselves at the crossover there at River Road. And then they're installing um, underground duct banks along the crossover and the picture on your right. Next slide. And here they're, they're repairing a concrete underground duct bank near Canfield, which is between Cumberland and Harlem. They had to dig out the concrete duct bank that runs between the two tracks and make repairs to it and ultimately pour new concrete around it. So here you can see that concrete installation occurring. My next project is our Logan Square Station repair project. As I've talked, the only remaining piece on this is the second elevator, uh, which is currently on schedule to reopen at the end of this month. Can you advance the slides, please, to the pictures? Um, here on the first picture, you can see the demolition of that uh, of the existing elevator from street level to mezzanine. And on the next slide, you can see the installation of the structures for the new elevator. So that is the that is the base that the floor of the elevator itself will be installed on top of, and the new cab will be built around that. Uh, my next project is our electric bus in route charging stations, which remains on budget and tight to schedule. Uh, most of the work has focused and remains focused on the installation of the, of the facility at Navy Pier. If we could advance the slides to those photos. Um, here we actually have a full building on site, fully constructed with roofs and walls, and they've begun doing inside work in that facility. Uh, the picture on the left shows some, uh, them starting to pull cabling into the facility through the, uh, the, the piping I've been showing you that was laid in the foundation. And the picture on the right shows the installation of the roof and uh, the, the culvert wall to it. Next slide, please. And here you can see the finishes being added to the exterior. So all the masonry, the CMU, solid structural elements, of the building are in, are in place. Now they're adding the finishing brickwork that uh, creates its ornate nature. Um, that project continues to advance now towards uh, the phase where we do mostly interior work on that complex. So, uh, my next project is our traction, our transformer upgrade. Um, if we can advance to the slide describing the work, uh, most of the work has com been completed now at Lotus and Washington substation, and we've moved forward to Edmonds substation, which is up near Jefferson Park on the blue line. You move to the next slide. So here is the last of the transformers at Lotus. What they're doing here is they're actually creating a shoring tower to hold the um, anode bus bar, which connects the rectifier inside the building to the transformer that's being replaced on the outside of the building. Next slide. And here is uh, Edmonds. This is the breaker that allows power to go from the transformer into the rectifier that's been uh, isolated out and secured in a lockout tag out for protection of the people so they can remove that old piece of equipment. My next project is our 98th bridge deck. Um, if we can advance to the photos here. Um, so since we last met, they've completely demoed out the west side of the bridge. And here's in this first photo shows you the demolition. As I mentioned in previous meetings, it's, a, it's kind of a phased demolition of the structure of the bridge itself so that we can maintain access to the shop at all times. So here, the first phase is removal of the west side of the structure. We removed that overhead canopy in previously pictures. So they've removed that subgrade of structure now. Next slide. And here they've started, they've reinstalled the new steel that is that underside structure for that, that, side, that portion of the bridge. And here is the new surface. So we're doing something different here on this bridge um, to help deal with some of the water issues we've had is that versus having a concrete tub on the bridge that risks deterioration due to buildup of site, uh, ice and salt and water. We're actually doing a graded metal bridge. So these are heavy formed graded metal sections that are then the floor of the bridge. And then here, all that graded metal is on that half of the bridge, and they've started installing the railings, the guardrails, and the beams that ultimately the new roof gets installed on. This pr project is progressing very well. And one of the last features on the in interior of the building, as I showed you previously, is we had to um, redo that penthouse floor, which was the ceiling for the locker room and the lunchroom underneath it. And so we relocated those rooms, and now we fully restored both the locker room and the lunchroom. And here are the new lockers and benches and light fixtures that were installed as part of that restoration. 
And at the bottom side of the bridge, so the columns that support all that bridge structure are also being uh, renewed. They've what they've done is they've broken off any loose concrete. They've reprepped the metal that's underneath it, and now they're doing concrete repairs and installing new concrete around it. So I have a new project for you this month. Uh, this is what part of our fast tracks program. Um, this is the Ravenswood Ballast Two pro portion of it. So this takes work that was tied to, uh, I had showed you a project last year on the Ravenswood ballast up in the area between Kimball and Francisco, where we did work at the Francisco grade crossing and within the stations at Rockwell and Kedzie and Francisco. Uh, this picks up work that is tracked between Rockwell and Francisco, as well as tracked near Kimball terminal and the grade crossing at Kedzie. And Kedzie's a very heavy, busy truck route uh, and that grade crossing sees a pretty significant amount of beating because of it. Uh, it's a pretty quick moving project. It has uh, three outage weekends to facilitate the work associated with it. Um, the contractor is Kiewit. And sorry, let me just get the right note in front of me. And it's a total project budget of just shy of $8 million with a contract value of $5 million. Um, it has a DBE goal of 20% with a commitment of 20.19%. So if we can move to the first uh, round of pictures. So the activity to begin with, it was associated with Kedzie grade crossing. Those were the focus of the first two weekends. Um, and here they are cutting the rail associated with that grade crossing to be able to remove that rail as part of the demolition process. Next slide, please. Um, here they are demolishing uh, the, the existing track there. So it's being so that what was previously an asphalt and rubber pad grade crossing has been completely removed and demolished. Next slide. Uh, similar to what we did at Francisco, they then dug down and poured in a new duck bank underneath each side of the tracks that then facilitates all the signal equipment that goes across the grade crossing. Next slide, please. And here is the new concrete tubs for that portion of the track being reinstalled. So each track got prefab concrete track um, that the rail ultimately gets installed in and has a series of sub layers above that duck bank mixed between um, compressed stone, asphalt, and then ultimately leveling sand. And then the concrete tubs themselves get set. And here, they, they, those tubs are all being set again. They're being lined up so that the new rail can be brought in and adjusted to the, the existing track. Next slide, please. Can you go back one slide, please? Sorry. So um, what happens then is we did the first track and then we, we moved to the second track and then um, we ultimately tie those two together with a concrete section in the middle, which I'll have some pictures of for you in future presentations. Um, so at this time, this completes my portion of the construction report. I'll be glad to take any questions. Are there any questions? Um, excuse me, before we take any questions, Chairman Alvaro Zales, I think it would be a good time to switch um, the sign language interpreters and go back to Ellen. So let me make sure that gets done. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Ellen's on. So then, uh, Chairman, we can go back to your uh, asking the board for questions. Are there any questions from the board? I don't. Hey, Bill, I just have a question about that um, that bridge, um, the metal bridge um, down at so it's like uh, 95th. Yes, sir. Your building. Is it just going to be like a, just a metal grate, um, or is there going to be any kind of a, um, a smoother surface on top of it? Uh, there, are, there are walkways that go with it that have a smoother surface on top of it. Okay. Yeah. Main right. truck pack passage is, is a metal grate. Got it. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Um, actually, I have a question with regards to the bridge, too. So you said that that was to help deal with water issues. Um, so is that being used, the graded metal bridge, is that being used in other locations now as well to try to deal with those types of issues? Um, so we haven't actually done any other bridges similar to this. It's kind of a unique piece of property for us. So the entrance for this shop, it's a multi-story shop and the entrance is actually an elevated entrance, which is why this bridge exists. It's how you gain access from the street on State Street there into the shop itself. Um, and we can load in material and that's how personnel get to it because the, the yard and the, sh the shop and the rail yard ultimately go below that, that grade. 
I think, you know, one of the things as we looked at why the deterioration occurred on the bridge is we looked for opportunities to improve upon that. And we, we felt like the galvanized steel was uh, for the durability and the use of this bridge was a good option. It's not always the greatest option. So we have other circumstances where we have bus vehicular traffic and passenger traffic that, you know, having, a, as Director Irvine noted, a smooth surface, especially for ADA uh, purposes, is, is really a requirement. And th in those circumstances, you know, with the more, more of that volume of wheel movement, concrete works out a lot better for us. So I think it's a case by case scenario. Got it. More of a unique situation in this instance. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, great. Thank you so much, Bill. Appreciate it. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, ask Chris Bruchel to make his report on the RPM presentation. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, RPM phase one design build contract um, continues on budget and tight to schedule. If we could go to the next slide. One more slide, please. So the uh, progress since um, our, our last report uh, continue, uh, continues with um, a lot of design. We still are at about 65 to 70% uh, with design. There has been a number of large packages that have been um, under development and going through the interdisciplinary review uh, coordination process. Um, so that effort um, continues to move forward. Um, in addition, the signal designer, um, which is being handled by the um, signal subcontractor Hitachi um, is advancing their work um, principally with regard to some of the final pre-stage signaling elements, but also with regard to the, uh, the design work associated with a, the larger corridor signal improvements um, that will come. Uh, red purple bypass, um, we are in the process of um, accepting our first uh, deliveries of steel this week. Um, if uh, we'll, we'll see in some of the subsequent slides, the fit up of some of that steel. Um, at the producer's yard um, in Missouri. Um, the corridor signal improvements, we are continuing with um, testing the, um, the uh, DG track circuit. This is the track circuit um, that will be installed in the, in the corridor wide project. Um, in addition, um, they are uh, working on various uh, pieces of production relative to some of the pre-stage um, houses. Although at this point, um, we're really in terms of uh, the pre-stage work, um, we are in the process of installing electrical to support most of the houses. You'll see, you'll see some of that in the photographs to come. Um, in pre-stage, um, probably the, the biggest piece of work that's going on besides the installation of um, cabling and, and other infrastructure associated with the two major duct banks that, or major uh, interlockings that we installed over the course of the summer is the construction of the temp stations. Um, you'll see some photographs today of, of that construction. It is um, really starting to, uh, to pick up substantially. Um, and then in terms of the larger Lawrence to Bryn Mawr modernization, um, we are continuing with the pr production of precast box girder segments. You'll again see some photographs of that in the report to follow. Um, next slide, please. So I mentioned um, in the bypass that uh, the steel for this bypass was in the fit-up stage. So after it's produced, as you can see here, they, they uh, mock up the, the installation of it just to make sure that all the components um, fit and that there's no issues before they break it down to ship. Um, so you can see it here being assembled um, in, the, uh, in their yard in Missouri. You can see the Mississippi River in the background there. Next slide. Um, so in the, uh, the pre-stage work, you can see um, the construction of the Thorndale Relay House. Um, this is a platform in association, obviously, with the Thorndale Interlocking that we installed this past summer. Next, please. Uh, temporary station. So the stations have both a, a at grade um, requirement or at, at grade uh, construction as well as um, on the right of way. So you can see here the installation of platform steel. Um, uh, on the outside of the tracks and then between um, tracks two and three in this four track corridor, you can see the installation of the, uh, of the, of the foundations um, for the temporary station in association with our first phase of segmented box girder construction. Next slide, please. So um, segmented box girders. Um, this is the production of those um, box girders in Morris, Illinois. Um, they are continuing to move forward on, on schedule. They had some initial, uh, you know, they were developing their um, process and, and, uh, and as such their efficiency was a little bit lower, but they've moved up to a production level that um, reflects the schedule and, uh, and, and we're, we're pleased that their quality also remains very high. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, so again, pre-stage work relative to signaling. Um, so this is the installation of the Montrose um, relay house. Uh, so this, this per proceeded without incident. If we go to the next slide, um, the sister house to Montrose came almost at the same time was uh, Berwyn. Uh, we have two more to set, uh, Thorndale and Loyola. Um, actually, we've, we've set them. Um, we'll see photographs of, of that in the next, um, next board meeting. Um, so this is the, the Berwyn house. Uh, they kind of come in pairs. So we get two of them within a one week period and then we, we set them and then proceed to connect them to um, various interlocking throughout, interlockings throughout the system or track circuits. Uh, next slide. Um, advanced contracts are in closeout. Um, no, nothing real new, new, new here. Uh, we continue to, to finish this work, um, mostly uh, relatively minor cable pulling uh, or utility terminations, um, some comm service switchovers in coordination with uh, customers and, uh, and, and, and various uh, um, aldermen and others interested parties in the areas, but, but very, it, it is in closeout. Um, Nothing really to report, no photographs. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next. Next. So community outreach. Um, we are participating in various um, uh, system-wide efforts, uh, healthy kit distribution. We are also, though, using those as opportunities um, in the uh, RPM project area to collect people's information, mostly email addresses, uh, so that we can provide them with various service alerts or other information um, about the, uh, the project, um, including our Open for Business campaign, um, which is uh, really kicking into gear here, you know, with all the impacts associated with COVID. Um, we are uh, uh, undergoing a, a pretty active um, Open for Business campaign um, to support the businesses that at this point are probably more impacted by COVID than RPM, but we feel this is a good opportunity um, to, to get some goodwill for the project. Uh, we are meeting, continuing with the, with the aldermen associated with uh, Open for Business, but also various pieces of construction. Um, we've had some meetings with Loyola. You, you heard me talk about a Loyola relay house. We had to set that kind of right in the back of the university and, and make sure that we were in coordination with any remote activities they have at the moment. Um, and then we are having virtual office hours. So we have a virtual environment where people from the community can come in and ask us questions. Um, we, uh, we've, we've done a couple sessions with that so far. Um, and that really concludes my report on community outreach. Um, if I could turn it over to Juan Pablo, that would be great. Oh, keep I that slide up there. There we go. Chris, I have a quick question with regards to the open for business. Um, how are we seeing the businesses do in the area? I mean, are most of them staying afloat? Um, you know, I would say we have two uh, two predominant business communities uh, in, in for the project as a whole. Um, the businesses in and around um, in and around uh, the, the bypass. Um, those are kind of associated for the most part more or less with Wrigley Field um, and kind of ebb and flow with the Cubs. We were seeing um, kind of a reshuffling of those businesses in that area. Um, associated with various things that were happening in the in the communities around um, the stadium. So I would say that those businesses are less affected by construction at the moment um, and probably more affected by general trends with the with the Cubs and, and with COVID. In the area of Lawrence to Bryn Mawr, um, I think you see a lot of small family owned uh, retail businesses, particularly restaurants um, that have been significantly impacted by by COVID. Um, you know, there many of the restaurants are that have uh, strong delivery services um, are are hanging on, albeit um, in in smaller. Uh, they're contracting a little bit. Um, uh, it is a significant impact, though. Um, we are doing everything we can to make sure that when we're you know as we open the temp stations that we're creating whatever opportunities we can for um, those local businesses and otherwise um, just making them uh, you know available of the kind of resources that we can bring to the table in terms of advertising um, or or other business opportunities um, through our websites or open for business campaign 
Um, but frankly, it's a big concern in the LBMM area, and we're working very closely with the aldermen and the local chambers of commerce to mitigate mitigate impacts. Well, thank you for for the information and for all the work that our team is doing. Really appreciate that. Before we go to Juan Pablo, does anyone else from the board, uh, any of the directors have any questions for Chris? I see no. Okay. Um, Chairman, Chairman, it's Greg again. Yeah. Um, I think because we got another long um, presentation coming, I think now would be a good time to change the sign language interpreters. We're probably like the final time. So I'll wait for LJ to come on and then we can start. Great. Thanks, right. Greg. Ellen's off. Okay, Chairman, back to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Juan Pablo? Hi. Good morning, Directors. Juan Pablo Prieto, Director of Diversity Programs. Uh, we continue to meet monthly with the prime contractor to discuss workforce and DB outreach and compliance. In September, we attended virtual membership meetings for the U.S. Minority Contractors Association Black Contractors, Owners and Executives, and Federation of Women Contractors to speak about our Building Small Businesses Program and opportunities on RPM. Uh, attending these membership meetings was in preparation for our October 8th virtual BSB session. During our virtual quarter four session, we had 15 firms attend the workshop and nine firms attend the one-on-one -on -one sessions. To date, including CARES Act funding, the Building Small Businesses Program has helped firms secure over $4.7 million in capital, with almost $1 million more in capital being requested. We will continue to host these sessions to provide support for firms interested in bidding on opportunities on RPM. That concludes my portion of the construction report. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Juan Pablo? No, I, get, I thank you to everybody. I, I guess I just have a, a comment more so than a question. Um, I know we've discussed this before, but with regards to uh, some of the outreach that you do, I know uh, we've talked about when we see that some of the contracts that we have um, are not being fulfilled by DBEs because we don't have any of those in the market. And down the road, maybe in three years or something, that contract is going to come up. That is something that you're communicating um, to the communities, the business community, so that maybe some business can prepare itself to bid on that, you know, at a later date. Uh, yes, Vice Chair, we we are going through um, the last three years worth of contracts that have had uh, zero percent or low DBE goals assigned to them, and breaking out the work categories that have had those low the low availability of DBEs so that we can talk to our technical assist agencies and other partners about where firms can expand to. Um, maybe there are already firms, small businesses that exist in this, uh, in these areas that are just not DBE certified. So we can talk to them about the certification process and get their um, applications submitted. Um, or maybe there's entrepreneurs looking to start new businesses and, and wondering what is a good industry to get into. So, we can present this um, to our partners as opportunities for those folks. I, I really appreciate that, especially during this time, because so many of the companies are having to pivot, right? And so to know a direction to pivot. And, and I asked that also because today on the agenda, I saw one of those. Um, yeah. So I think it was in the area of cranes, right? And that we don't have any more DBs in that particular area. So in the, something in the lifts, correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. No, we appreciate that. I guess no other questions. So, um, all right. Thank you so much to the three of you for presenting. We appreciate that. And uh, I guess we've reached our next agenda item, which is new business. Uh, Greg, is there any new business for us? No, Chairman Alvarez, there's no new business today. Great. Well, thanks everyone. And with no further business to come before the board, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Moved by Judge Chevrolet, seconded by Reverend Miller. I'll not take a roll call vote. Judge Chevrolet? Yes. Reverend Miller? Yes. Reverend Jakes? Yes. Director Irvine? Yes. Director Silva? Yes. Chairman Alvaro Rosales? Yes. Motion to adjourn passes with six yes votes, so we are adjourned. Thank you.